Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and also good evening, not only to the people here at Rock Creek, not just Columbus, but that's in Maryland, who are hosting this wonderful talk by Michael Boris, but the people who are watching us on Facebook Live. So after his talk, we'll be taking up a free will offering, and those of you who are watching online will have an opportunity to donate online. Then we'll go back to Michael for questions and answers. Just a few quick things about Michael. He's the head founder of churchbuilding.com, which is doing so much to expose the problems in our beloved Catholic Church and come up with remedies. Just a few months ago, he pioneered a wonderful rally over in Baltimore in a big concert tent, which is about 100 yards from where our bishops were meeting. I mean 100 yards, truly 100 yards. Many of those great speakers, people like Alan Keyes, uh, Michael Hitchborn were literally pointing over to the huge auditorium where the bishops were meeting at that very moment. Some great things happened. This great bishop from Tyler, Texas came over. Uh, we later invited him to our networking sessions. We had networking sessions at a nearby hotel. We couldn't get into the bishop's hotel, not surprisingly. So we had to go a block and a half. But we had good people leading various wonderful postulates from around America plus this wonderful bishop from Tyler, Texas, who came and addressed this both evenings. So good things are happening, but one of the best things is the speaker that you're about to hear. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Michael Horace. Senior already said a prayer, but I always just, for my own talks, like to begin with a prayer uh, also to our Blessed Mother. And given the uh, time, which is just a couple of moments after 8 o'clock, uh, I'd also like to add on to the end of that an eternal rest. It was uh, my father died exactly one year ago today, about five minutes ago. Uh, uh, Ross, he was, if you saw today's vortex, I made some. Uh, uh, comments about that uh, and he was a tremendous Catholic man and uh, many of you know the story of my mother praying uh, you know for my reversion to the faith uh, so I kind of like to think that my mother was the impetus for the apostolate beginning and my father was the impetus for the apostolate continuing uh, he was a very very strong supporter of everything we did uh, and is now both my mom and dad are now even stronger supporters uh, they both said to me, I thought it was a wonderful thing that we'll say our prayer, they both said to me uh, on their respective deathbeds, 14 years apart, they both said, uh, you know, Michael, uh, you know, when we're gone, when I'm gone, I'll be able to be with you much more than I ever was in this life. And uh, it's a beautiful gift of the, the supernatural reality that we live in and sometimes don't really pay enough attention to because we're sort of stuck in this natural reality for a while, but you know, you gotta keep your feet on earth and your head in heaven, right? So, Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Holy Queen, Mother of mercy, our life, our sweetness, and our hope. To thee we cry for the children of Eve. To thee we send up our sighs, mourning and weeping in this valley of tears. And turn then, most gracious advocate, thine eyes of mercy towards us. And after this our exile, show unto us the blessed fruit of thy womb, Jesus. O come and delight in the sweet Virgin Mary. Pray for us, O Holy Mother of God. That we may be made worthy of the promises of Christ. The eternal rest grant unto my Father, O Lord. And let thy perpetual light shine upon him. May he and the souls of all of the faithful departed, through your sweet mercy, Jesus, rest in peace. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for that. One of the advantages, actually, of standing in front of a Catholic crowd and talking is if you have a personal prayer, you get to have it multiplied a couple hundred times. So, <laughs> so thank you for that. Uh, I, uh, first, where's Jack? There you go. Jack, thank you for coming. Missy, where's Missy? Thank you for driving today. We had a adventure uh, coming out of the airport. <laughs> uh, I uh, 
great honor to be here. You're involved in a great work. Uh, life uh, is a great gift from God. Obviously, the most important gift from God. You can't have eternal life if you don't start off with, you know, basic natural life. Uh, so you are protecting not only the lives of uh, human beings here on earth, but essentially what you are doing is protecting life so that, uh, of the future citizens of heaven. So uh, that's the work you're involved in, natural and supernatural. You know who your enemy is, you know who your ally is. I don't have to tell you anything about this. You know everything about this as it is. So uh, my hat's off to you. Being out in the pro-life work right now is extremely uh, taxing. It's, uh, it's up and down. There's lots of cheering, lots of crying, lots of everything. So uh, you, know, you, you just keep fighting the battle. Just keep fighting the battle. You know, as Saint, uh, Saint Mother Teresa said, uh, God doesn't ask you to be successful, he asks you to keep trying. So keep trying, leave the success to him. Um, uh, I've been asked to talk about uh, the homosexual infiltration into the church, specifically uh, the hierarchy and the clergy. Now, since I don't really know much about this, it's gonna be a really short talk. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, in our work at the Apostolate, the Apostolate, for the record, by the way, is St. Michael's Media. That's what we started in very late 2005. Uh, we made our very first purchases of camera equipment and stuff like that uh, the week after Thanksgiving, last week of November of 2005, uh, and then sort of got the ball rolling, and it, was, it still is St. Michael's Media, but the online presence of St. Michael's Media is churchmilitant.com. Uh, so this awareness came to us, uh, so we started connecting the dots, I suppose you could say, on all of this, probably right about the time Obama went to Notre Dame in 2009. And that's almost 10 years ago, by the way. Uh, so yeah, if you're not feeling old, well there, now you can feel old. Um, we, uh, prior to that, we'd heard all these sort of different little stories and you know you could sort of look around the church and see the uh kind of the collapse i suppose you could call in different areas liturgy morality belief catechesis parish life all of this but we're sort of a, what's kind of the binding nature of all of this the sort of why is all of this happening across the board and uh if you might want to think of it as think of those areas in the church as like departments. Why is every department suffering tremendously? What's going wrong? And in 2009, I went to Notre Dame, graduated in 83, and uh, of course, so I paid special attention when they heard that Obama was going to go to Notre Dame. I figured myself, are you kidding me, really? The child killer in chief is not only going to go for the uh, commencement uh, and be the speaker, but they're going to drape honors on him. How on earth is this even happening? And it, 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 was, it was just stunning. So I went down with the camera crew uh, to Notre Dame and there was a, a, a protest graduation ceremony also going on at the same time on the exact opposite end of campus, opposite in more ways than one. And uh, I was down there with that, shooting that, and I happened to glance back, we were standing on South Quad, and I happened to glance back towards the Golden Dome, and I saw Air Force One flying over, and the landing gear opened up and came down right over the dome. And uh, for those of you unfamiliar, the Golden Dome has a big statue of the Mother of God, of Our Lady on top. And I just started crying. I was like, oh my God, I just was overcome. This is my school. It's a beautiful, beautiful day. Middle of May, 2009. Absolutely gorgeous day. And uh, I just started crying when I watched it. Just, it was like Satan coming back into the garden. That's what it struck me as. And uh, so, we, you know, we did all the professional things, shot the event, you know, did the interviews. And on the drive back to Detroit, I couldn't put together in my head how this had happened. How could this event have happened? 
there were, if you include the auxiliary bishops and the retired bishops, at the time, there were 400, just slightly, I was like 389, I think, or 392, something like that. Very close to 400 bishops total in the U.S. 88 protested it. So less than 25% actually approaching close to 20%. The other 80% were completely silent. Said nothing. And of the 88 that signed something, or made, many of them just signed sort of a state conference note. They didn't write their own individual note. They just, you know, the, the Michigan Catholic Conference, for example, just got together, made a statement. They all just signed on it because, you know, it's, I guess you're too busy trying to raise money to, uh, or cover up something that we were going to find out a few years later um, to actually spend time making your own, uh, your own statement. So on the way back, I was it just going through my mind. It was kind of a Catholic intuition. Like, there's no way, there's no way this event should have happened. Mm -hmm. 350,000 Catholics signed just one petition. Mm -hmm. Most of them lay people, I presume, and go through the list. Uh, and then there were all sorts of other little petitions, you know, 10,000 here, 20,000 there, 15,000 there, sort of what so, an enormous number of lay people. And the fact that this just made no registration at all, Father Jenkins had a wonderful little priest arrested on campus. Do you remember this? Yeah. He wasn't doing anything. God rest his soul. He's, he's gone to God now. He was just standing there praying. And the cops came, put him on the ground, put their knee in his back, handcuffed him, and let him off. Over 80 uh, lay Catholics on the Catholic campus were uh, arrested. Father Jenkins, the president of Notre Dame, refused to relent. He would not uh, tell the prosecutor to drop the charges. That standoff, I'm taking you back in memory here, that standoff went on for months. Monica Miller in uh, Michigan, in Detroit, uh, was one of the, they called them the Notre Dame 88. Uh, and you're hearing all this, you're thinking, What's gone wrong? And the reason I'm talking about this to begin with is because this is sort of one of those flashpoints. It's not just, oh, this happened in my diocese, or my bishop's a little crazy, or the pastor in my parish is a little nuts. This was sort of a universal moment in the church in America. And because it was a universal moment, it was something that every bishop not only could have spoken on, but should have spoken on, and the vast majority of them just decided to sit out on the sidelines. That's when our mission changed at St. Michael's Media to Church Militant. Driving back is about a three hour drive. We get to drive through Ann Arbor uh, on the way back, it's about 45 minutes west of Detroit. I went to Notre Dame, so of course I spit out the window and we get to Ann Arbor, University of Michigan. <laughs> uh, gotta, gotta, gotta say something about Michigan. Um, but on the way back, it was just kind of formulating, going something. So we spent the next few weeks, roughly, probably about a month, looking into how could this have been the case? How is this? And what is the signal that so many, many bishops, 80%, essentially what we're talking about. 80% of the bishops could keep quiet on such an affront to the faith. And so we started researching. I started picking up the phone. I started calling people I knew who had been in the battle for a long time. Some of them are some of the faces on these posters. Uh, I started reading some books. I started talking to all sorts of different people. And little by little, I came to the same conclusion independently that an awful lot of other people had come to that, uh, and now it's a big leap, but I think given the current climate of what's going on, it's really the only uh, real answer there is. And the answer is that a sufficient number of 
bishops in America, this is true in the world too, we're speaking about America, uh, simply no longer believe the Catholic faith. That's just the reality. And that isn't to just so that's, you can draw that from the conclusion at Notre Dame. You start looking around the church and you start looking at the complete rejection of things that are Catholic, the out and out rejection of Catholic teaching by bishops and certainly by chanceries all over the country and various uh, priests and you know the, the chancery staff personnel, vicar generals or judicial vicars and you know the departments of education and all of this sort of stuff. Here's a question for you. I like to do this every time. I'm going to ask you. I'm going to ask for a show of hands. How many of you know in your very close circle, meaning your close family or maybe a, you know a friend who's really close to you? How many of you know at least four people who were Catholic who have abandoned the faith? <laughs> Keep your hands up. Now turn around and look. Keep your hands up. <laughs> All right. That says everything you need to know. I've never asked that question. I've given hundreds of talks. I have never asked that question and not seen that reaction anywhere in the world. I've spoken in 19 countries. I've spoken in probably 200, maybe 300 venues in the United States. I have never not seen that response. So you have to ask yourself, well, how is that? How is it that an enormous majority of Catholics have simply lost the faith? How's that possible? They don't practice the faith. They can't really believe the faith at least not in any solid kind of manner. They might have some sort of touchstone to it or some sort of nostalgic or emotional connection to it. You know, grandma used to go, so we go on Christmas Eve or something like that. The famous Christmas Easter Catholics, the Christers. But aside from that, the real number of Catholics in the United States has fallen to an abysmal percentage. So let's do the math, shall we? Okay. Uh, there are roughly, it's kind of the, the USCCB, the Bishops' Conference, keeps one set of numbers uh, that get sort of from official roles and baptismal roles of the parishes and the diocese, and they get reported up each year. And then different groups like Gallup and Pew do their research also. Uh, the, the sort of middle agreed upon number is there are 70 million Americans who are baptized as Catholic. Okay, so 70 million. Well, 80% of them don't go to Mass. So what are you left with now? Approximately 15 million. Of those, an enormous number of the pew sitters simply don't accept the teachings of the church. They just they pick and choose, and they'll pick what they want, and that's it. They'll call themselves Catholic. They even go to masses in a parish where the priest or the pastor either preaches heresy or near heresy, and they pick and choose which teachings of the church that they're going to agree with. That's not Catholic. That's called Protestant. So let's just say that number's half. That means of 70 million Catholics in the United States, only 7 million are really Catholic. Practicing the faith, believing the teachings of the church. So you're really talking about approximately 10%. So 90% of the church in the United States is either in apostasy, heresy, or schism. That's, that's got to be your starting point because that's the reality. 
So you've got to look and say, hmm, how is this the case? Was it always like this? No, it wasn't. There are many of you here, judging from your hair color, who remember a different time in the church. <laughs> in living memory, my father converted to the faith in 1954, and the church was massively vibrant. The idea that a Catholic wouldn't go to Mass on Sunday, he'd be tarred and feathered. So what happened in those few generations? And it was always like that. 75, 80% of Catholics went to Mass every Sunday in, the 19, in 1965. 75, 80% of Catholics don't go to Mass just 50 years later. So what happened in those 50 years? That's a dramatic drop-off. And to just lay aside one point real quickly, uh, people say, well, this has happened to all kinds of churches all over the place. They've all had their numbers go down. They've broken into all of these other different little sects. There's, there's the evangelicals, the Pentecostals, and the this, and the that's, and the mainline Protestants, and uh, none of those churches, I'll use the term very loosely, ecclesial communities, uh, None of those are the true faith. Funny thing, if you get into a discussion with lots of Protestants, they'll tell you, yeah, the Catholic Church is the original church. I mean, it's just a historical fact. There was no such thing as a Protestant church before 1517. So you've got to say, what happened? What happened to the Catholic Church? And outside of America, the same thing started happening again. It's happening in Europe as well. All throughout the West and English-speaking countries, this phenomenon was going on. A sudden rush to accept contraception on the part of the laity, a sudden rush to not preach about it on the part of the clergy, a moving along with the culture is what the leaders did. And are still doing. So if you go back and say, this was such a dramatic, cataclysmic swing of events in such a short period of time, a half century to eradicate centuries and centuries and centuries and centuries of tradition and practice wiped out in three generations. How on earth did that happen? Something has to explain it. So as you look at the unfolding, the historical unfolding of this, when the Bolsheviks came to power in Russia during the October Revolution, 1917, and after the dust had sort of settled and Joseph Stalin was, you know, the supreme power there, he set up, or had ordered, set up a network of communist infiltration into the Catholic Church, in particular, the seminaries. And there... This is getting a little bit ahead of a story that we haven't actually published yet. <laughs> uh, but, hey, you're here, and so are our friends on Facebook. <laughs> the monastery that you've heard so much about, St. Gallen in Switzerland, was one of the centers that Stalin had set up. That's why Theodore McCarrick was in Switzerland for a year during his training. Yeah. <laughs> click, click. Yeah. Yeah. Now, a fellow who started the Italian Communist Party, the founder of it, Antonio Gramsci, 
had seen the way Stalin was sort of brutalizing religion and trying to, followers of religion, and trying to tear down what largely in the uh, uh, Soviet Union was the Orthodox Church, but they kind of went along with enough things that he wasn't quite as violent with them, but he was certainly violent with the Catholics and you know, had the little gulag thing going and everything. So he uh, started a essentially a vicious persecution campaign against the Catholic Church in Soviet-occupied territories and Russia. Antonio Gramsci, founder of the Italian Communist Party, said to himself, and he went to <coughs> Moscow to talk to Stalin and said, that is the wrong approach. You can't beat religion out of people. You can't, you'll, if you do anything, you'll make their faith stronger. Persecutions don't work. You can't kill all of them. Well, Stalin didn't listen to him, but Gramsci goes back to Italy, now under the uh, control of Benito Mussolini, and he starts writing and his objective is that we need to set about on a long course because uh, worldwide communism will never, this is his writings, will never be successful until the Catholic Church is eradicated. The Catholic Church, his words, he's right, but the Catholic Church is the enemy of, uh, of Marxism. So he disagrees with Stalin's tactic, tells him that, comes back to Italy, comes back to Rome, uh, and starts trying to organize various ways to destroy the church. How to set in motion a very long, multi-year plan. And in this, he hooks up with Stalin's goal, Stalin's plan. Stalin's plan, as told to us by Beladad, who was, a, who was the uh, president of the Communist Party here in the United States in the 20s and 30s, uh, uh, as repeated to us again by Alice von Hildebrand, uh, that the plan was to put men in Catholic seminaries in Europe and in the United States, and Belladon knows this because Belladon is the one who orchestrated it here in the United States, she told Bishop Sheen this when she converted to the faith in the 50s. And at the direction of Joseph Stalin, the type of men that were supposed to go into the seminaries were immoral men who were homosexual. That was the order from Joseph Stalin. And so she set about doing this. She put her plan together, she recruited from amongst communist agents, found the right people, and figured, well, if you get enough people in there, some of them are going to begin to rise through the ranks. She told Bishop Sheen, she told Alice von Hildebrand, she told Dietrich von Hildebrand, she went around the country after she converted in the early 60s. Uh, we have a couple of affidavits from people who signed the affidavits for us, telling us this is what she said in the talks that she gave. So she's either lying through her teeth or she's telling the truth. There are multiple, we have Alice von Hildebrand on camera telling us this is what she's told her. Uh, she put approximately 1,100 communist agents into Catholic seminaries in the United States. Now, were all of those guys wildly successful? No, of course not. Take a group of 1,100 men, some have natural talents and abilities and, you know, they have a certain charism or charismatic personality, some are industrious, whatever. But she said that the point of their mission was to just sow a little doubt here and there. That's Antonio Gramsci's plan. All you do is just sprinkle a little poison into the mix, and it will sort of take care of itself, like sowing weeds into a field. The weeds will eventually 
you know, grow and take over and start to choke the plants. So when you look at the, uh, the flow of how all of this worked, if you go back and look at the John Jay report that measured the incidence of child sex abuse, you know, when the Boston Globe did its big spotlight series starting in January of 2002 and actually kept it going until November with, I don't know, they weren't daily reports, but they were very frequent. That inspired the U.S. bishops, forced the U.S. bishops to say, well, let's do a study. They went and hired the John Jay uh, uh, College of Criminal Studies, Pennsylvania. They studied the issue and they produced the first report in 2004. That report said that 80% of the uh, abuse that happened happened by homosexual men to teenage boys. It was not pedophilia. Pedophilia came in at somewhere around, if I remember the numbers, I might have them off slightly, but it was single digit. It was like 4% or 5%. And it is the press that sort of ran with this term pedophile. This is not a pedophilia problem. Are there prepubescent children who have been victimized? Yes. But to classify it as prepubescent children does a great disservice and is very unjust to the vast majority of victims who were 13, 14, 15, 16 year old boys who were generally altar boys. That makes it a question of pederasty, not a question of pedophilia. So now the question arises, hmm, when you talk about sex abuse with minors, outside of the church, 80, more than 80, percent of the victims are young girls. That's true across the culture. It's true in the schools. It's true every single where they have measured these things. 80% of the victims are girls. So how is it that in this one isolated case of Catholic clergy, 80% of the victims are teenage boys? The John Jay report, the first one, 2004, identified that the problem was homosexual men in the clergy. The uh, point man, I suppose you could say, for the uh, John Jay report uh, was now the Atlanta Archbishop Wilton Gregory. He said that at the, uh, when the report was issued and they had the big press conference. He said, it's homosexual men in the priesthood. It's a homosexual problem. <clears throat> Shortly after he said that, another imposing figure in the hierarchy stepped forward and said, oh no, it's not a homosexual problem. It's a problem of psychological immaturity. <laughs> quote, it's his quote, that man is Theodore McCarrick. Theodore McCarrick became the face of the Catholic Church's hierarchy in the United States, fixing the problem of psychological immaturity. That was in 2004. He was still the Archbishop of Washington, D.C. then, <clears throat> and had already been a multi-generational homosexual predator and still was. So the question is, how does somebody, see this is why many members of the hierarchy don't want to go to this issue. That's why they're blocking, that's why you have Cardinal Supich running around saying, oh this isn't a gay thing. In what crazy universe do you live in, your eminence, where 80% of the victims are teenage boys 
being sexually assaulted, sodomized, raped, just everything, by men, and you say it's not a homosexual thing. Well, what is it? The list of Catholic laity and clergy who have now, after all of these years in the face of what has turned out to be the case with McCarrick, and then the grand jury report, and the Vigano testimony, and one thing after another, the list continues to grow of very notable Catholics, lay as well as clergy, saying this is a homosexual problem in the clergy. That's what it is. Bishop Morlino, God rest his soul, who died, I believe it was last month, right? Jan December? Um, uh, had said that. He was the first one to say it. But he's been followed by other bishops who've come out and said it publicly. <coughs> the head of the bishop's National Review Board stood in front of them in Baltimore and said, you need to resign. Their own guy said, that's what this is. We went and interviewed a doctor in Philadelphia uh, who was on the original National Review Board in 2002. His interview's on the website. He came out and said, yeah, of course it's a homosexual thing. A grown man raping a teenage boy is a homosexual thing. So the question remains then, in spite of Cardinal Supich and other denials, how did this come to be the case? How is it that there are so out of proportion, the exact opposite of every other aspect of society? Why would this be happening? Well, the Catholic clergy was essentially assaulted from inside. Part of it was uh, communist plants back in the 1920s and 30s. And if you sort of start to kind of go through the timeline of this, the historical timeline. Okay, so if you've got this window from, say, 1920 to late 1930s, let's say 1930, 1920 to 1940, give it a bit of a generational thing. Okay, if you are a recruited, if you're a communist agent and you're recruited for this mission, you're a young guy, you're probably going to be about 20-ish. Uh, and you get plopped into a seminary in, say, 1925. You were born in 1905. You go through the process. You go through, you know, depending on what seminary you're in, four to six years. You get out in the early 1930s. You're beginning to approach your 30th year. Now, add 30 years to your age, that puts you into the mid-1960s, and some of you have been consecrated bishop. And all of a sudden, things start to come clear. Oh, by the time the 1960s roll around, some of those men have risen through the ranks and are now bishops. Now, they know what their mission was, <coughs> so what do they